Hello, welcome to another edition of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. This is Lawrence Coletti. I'm the host for today's show, which is being recorded on location at the 2019 ABA Annual Meeting from San Francisco, California. I have a great panel of guests joining me today. We're going to talk, this is a topic we have not discussed before ever. I picked it out just because we had not covered it ever with the ABA uh, at the mid-year meeting or annual. So the title of it is Taking a Bite out of blight, effective legal tools and innovative strategies in the battle to reuse problem properties. I must say that this uh, this particular presentation was sponsored by the section of state and local government law. Did I get that right, everyone? Yes. Excellent. So let me introduce our guest in terms. I'm going to start to my left. Uh, sitting next to me is Lynn Chin. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, over across the way here is Amber Nee. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And last but not least, I have over here, Jessica Basher. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Excellent. So uh, we we'll want to get a little bit of uh, a 50,000 foot before we begin. But before we get into that, just in terms of uh, where do you work? What do you do? Give our uh, audience a little bit of a context. Let's go back to Jessica with that. Uh, what's your bio? Hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Basher, and I'm the executive director of the Land Use Law Center at Pace Law School. So I'm teaching with students, and I'm also balancing that as a not-for-profit center, reaching out to communities to work on sustainable development practices. All right. And Amber? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amber Nee. I'm an urban planner in New York City. I work at the New York City Department of Transportation. Um, I previously worked in the Philadelphia area for the Philadelphia Land Care Program, which is how I got involved in this project doing vacant land management. All right. And Lynn? Hi, I'm the special projects manager at an affordable housing nonprofit organization based here in the Bay Area. It's called Hello Housing, and we partner with local government to develop and implement innovative housing solutions, especially around the missing middle and that promote homeownership. All right, so uh, taking a bite out of blight, who is responsible for the title of this session? I guess I have to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. um, this is Jessica, and uh, we were working a lot with the state and local government section on tools for lawyers, and so we've been doing a lot of work in this field and brainstorming things that sound good for panel titles, so clearly has a draw. Yes, it's got uh, it's got sizzle, as they say. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just in terms of the just a general sort of synopsis, just kind of an explanation uh, as to the the matters covered in there. Who wants to volunteer? Give us the fifty thousand foot. I back to Jessica. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the fifty thousand foot would be problem properties. How do how do we deal with them? What are the legal solutions? How do we balance those issues and work through them? And there's a lot of layers that you have to deal with. And so, you know, really kind of bringing that together with different perspectives. And so, I was lucky enough to be joined by Amber and Lynn to talk about that today. So just in terms of the specific definition of problem property, like I would consider where I live a problem property when I spill coffee in the carpet. So yeah. what is what exactly is a problem property? So a property that is distressed in some way. So vacant, um, the condition is dilapidated in some way. Um, so it's causing issues within the community, the neighborhood. It could be vacant, uh, garbage built up. Um, so it's really about condition and use of properties that would make them distressed and they're therefore problems for the community. Okay, so these problem properties, they become a nuisance to the community, like an abandoned house or uh, some unsightly hole in the ground somewhere <laughs> that uh, maybe is an attractive nuisance, as we all remember from law school. But uh, what are the biggest hurdles from fixing this, you know, in terms of getting a buyer to come in, fix it, or someone to develop it? What are the, what are the big, biggest hurdles? Well, uh, I don't even know where to start. Problem properties become problems for a variety of reasons. And I know that sounds like a throwaway comment, but it's really true. Uh, for, for regular folks, when you walk past a, a blighted property in your neighborhood, all you can see is that it's blighted, that it's a problem, that it hasn't been put to productive use. But the reason why that's so could be, um, could be for any number of reasons. It could be that the owner passed on and the heirs don't know uh, that they now own that property. It could be uh, owned by someone who's holding it for a speculative, speculative investment uh, and is purposely not investing in the development of that property. So I think there are a lot of reasons why these properties wind up uh, plaguing neighborhoods and depressing the vitality of neighbors' properties. So about like zoning and historic status, I know that that uh, could come up an issue where all of a sudden a whole block gets a historic uh, status upgrade. And I put that in quotes because then you want to come in and develop property, but it's prohibitively expensive to do anything. So is that some of the things that you're seeing too, an old, beautiful building, but it is caving in because nobody can afford to fix it? 
Yeah, th- I'm, that's really the case. We tackle that a lot in New York because we have old housing stock and often historic, often protected. And so people don't want to see it destroyed, but it's basically being destroyed by neglect because the cost to rehabilitate the property is so much that the market just can't balance that cost. So the bottom line doesn't work for the private sector. And that's where these tools come in to play, where the public sector needs to partner with them and develop tools and resources to make those projects work. And I've heard about this with uh, laundromats, too. And I can't remember what the exact designation is. Is it Brown, brown Zone? They call brown them? Fields. Brown Fields. And so all of a sudden, like the, uh, it becomes new. It gets zoned to Brown Field. And now you come in, and as part of the deal, you have to clean it up. And it's also prohibitively expensive. So it sits there blighted. So is that something else that you've encountered over time? And Very true. I, I think laundromats are a perfect example, but also abandoned gas stations in Oakland. That's a huge problem. Um, lots that were used for uh, as chop shops. There are a number of reasons why problem, uh, properties become contaminated. Excellent, excellent. And so, just in terms of stats from the community, you know, uh, just in terms of how many of these properties there are, and uh, you know, anything related uh, that people might find of interest in the community. Sure. Um, so, in Philadelphia, there's forty thousand vacant lots, um, and so. Currently, we are doing a Philadelphia land care treatment on them where we go in and we remove trash and debris, um, plant grass and trees and install a fence, and then they receive ongoing maintenance. Um, So the program maintains about 12,000 vacant lots, which is one third of the vacant land, um, but there's still many more to go. um, And it's a problem in a lot of major cities. Detroit also has about 100,000 vacant lots. New Orleans is um, grappling with, I think, 25,000 vacant lots. So it's a huge issue in post-industrial cities. Yeah, and Detroit, I think, is uh, pretty unique. I, I think I either saw in a documentary or I read somewhere that one of the issues with Detroit was that just in terms of their infrastructure, they didn't have mm-hmm. enough people living in an area to continue to provide services to them. So right. they're actually asking people to move mm-hmm. because they simply can't afford, uh, from a city perspective, to provide power to one out of 50 people in a given area. Uh, and so just in terms of you know that, that governmental restriction, how do you overcome that? So if something's been zoned a certain way or it gets a historic status and there's these properties that sit there vacant and uh, you know looking awful and being dangerous I mean how do you overcome that with with government entities so there's a variety of tools that you can use to overcome that it really goes back to the first question about what the cause is you have to identify sure. the cause to identify the solutions so everything from code enforcement to tools that are specifically registers registries for licensing of vacant properties to entities like land banks that can come in and intervene and acquire these properties and get them back on the tax rolls so it really depends on the specifics of the property and what the issue is what tool is going to work the best and just uh, let's, let's build upon that. You know, what, is there like one central repository for information on how to deal with these different types of property that somehow become blighted and can't be fixed for whatever reason? Is there is there a source we can turn to and uh, get some information? <laughs> well, funny you should mention that. Uh, one of the things that really inspired this panel and this work was the need for resources in this field. And so um, in partnership with Amber and some editors and a large number of authors from across the country, we just put out a book called Vacant and Problem Properties. And it's an ABA publication, and it really goes through all the different legal tools. It has case studies and real-world examples and and helps, you know, lawyers respond and identify the right tools and how to use them. Do you all have any idea, just in terms of dollars worth across the country, I don't know if there's an estimate out there of how many properties cannot be rehabilitated, what what the value of that might be? It, it's got to be billions. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a number, but it's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. All right. Well, excellent. Well, I, you know, thank you so much for, for stopping by on this. You know, uh, before we close it out, though, I, I wanted to, you know, just, uh, you know, have each one of you make some recommendations. I mean, obviously, that's one source that you just gave to us, Jessica. But if I could go around the table here and uh, if you wouldn't mind, give me some of your favorite sources of information just around the table, kind of give a nice broad base of uh, different uh, source material for people to use. Why don't we start with Lynn? Sure. I'd love to talk a little bit about the the project um, that I shared with our, on our ABA panel today, which is what we call a Chapter 8 pilot project. And it's really specific to California, but other states have similar tools that they can utilize to transform abandoned and vacant property into affordable housing. Uh, and that was a process that my organization, Hello Housing, innovated with the city of Oakland and the Alameda County Tax Collector's Office. 
Um, and the reason I mention it is because we've actually published a guide that's completely free. Uh, you can uh, reach out to me and I'll provide my contact information at the end of this podcast if you'd like a copy. But it's a free manual that helps other uh, city governments and nonprofit organizations do the same process that we did to acquire tax defaulted properties and turn them into a public benefit use, whether that's affordable housing or uh, green spaces. Same question, Amber. Sure. Yeah. So where I used to work, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society has been in this business for a long time. Um, They started in the early 1970s converting vacant lots into community gardens by working with the public to train them on community gardening and providing resources. Um, And then the program that I talked about today, the Philadelphia Land Care Program, is an interim landscape treatment that's very low cost um, and helps maintain properties in the in-between before they're ready for new use. Um, So they're a great resource for um, organizations across the country who are are looking for green reuse strategies. Um, also, uh, bring out the Center for Community Progress, which has done a lot of work on um, vacant property reuse. And um, yeah, they would be a great resource as well. All right, Jessica. Amber stole mine. I was going to say the Center for <laughs> Community Progress. They are a co-partner on the book as well. And so they really are a great resource. Their website, their conferences um, for people that really want to hone in on this topic and, and dig deeper. And one more time, where, where can you find that book? The book you can find at the ABA Publishing, so on the ABA's website. I think it's also available on Amazon or everywhere. Not everywhere that you buy books, but (laughs) at least Amazon and the ABA Publishing page. Excellent. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our program for this episode, but I want to thank all of you for stopping by. And, you know, if our listeners, they want to follow up, they've got this great deal in a property, want some expertise, how can they find you? Let's start back with Lynn. Uh, you can reach us at our website, Hello Housing. It's hellohousing.org. And you can contact me at Lynn, that's L I N, at hellohousing.org. All right, Amber. Sure. Um, so you can reach me at amber.ne at gmail.com. It's A M B E R dot K N E E at gmail.com. Last but not least, Jessica. You can reach me at jbasher at law.pace, P A C E dot E D O, and it's basher with a C. Wonderful, wonderful. So I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in because without our audience, we don't have a show. So thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this. And if you didn't, or if you did, please let us know all about it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or best yet, your favorite podcasting app. I'm Lawrence Scaletti signing off from the American Bar Association 2019 annual meeting in San Francisco. Until next time, thank you for listening. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Bye.